I'm Rena Yoakum. I am the Assistant General Secretary with the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry. My particular portfolio is clergy formation and theological education. We, from time to time, we ask uh, all candidates for ordained and licensed ministry to invest time, energy, and money in theological education. For some students, this time and experience deepens their faith. For some, it's a real life-changing experience. For everyone, it is a reflection of their beliefs, a new reflection on their beliefs and their calling. There are times when we hear congregations or members of boards of ordained ministry say to candidates, didn't they teach you that in seminary? <laughs> now that, that can be most anything a different subject. The Bishop's Task Force on Theological Education has stated that theological education should have three components, academic learning, spiritual formation, as well as a, a set of practical skills from administration to preaching. <clears throat> we want this morning to be the beginning of an ongoing conversation between boards of ordained ministry and the seminaries. And what we want to know this morning is how do seminaries perceive their role within the changing church dynamics and the shifting cultural context in which we do ministry? What does it mean to prepare persons for ministry in this, the 21st century? We have three faculty here this morning to help us gain perspective on these issues. Dr. Wanda Stahl is Assistant Professor of Contextual Theology and Practice. She serves as Director of Contextual Education and Congregational Partnerships at Boston School of Theology. She is a deacon in the New England Conference and she served that conference for 12 years as a director of Christian formation before going uh, to Boston. Dr. Laylene Rector is the Associate Professor, Psychology of Religion and Pastoral Psychotherapy. She is at Garrett Evangelical uh, Theological Seminary. And Dr. Robert Hunt is Director of Global Theological Education at Perkins School of Theology. Robert is a former missionary, and he has not only taught at seminaries in the United States, but also in Malaysia, Singapore, and Vienna. He lectures in the areas of interreligious dialogue on Islam and mission. The format that we will uh, have for this time together is that you will hear from each of our panelists, and then we'll give a time for the panelists to respond to one another, and then we'll open the floor for questions and answers. And so they will present in this order, Wanda, Laline, and Robert. Would you thank our panelists for being here today? Good morning. I've been at Boston University School of Theology as Director of Contextual Education and Congregational Partnerships for just over a year. And as I compare my previous experience there as a student 20 years ago to my current engagement with the School of Theology community, I've noticed some significant differences. When I was a student in the late 80s, early 90s, the majority of students came to seminary with a clear vocational focus. Most came preparing for ordination, some for academic careers, and a few for other reasons. Some of those plans shifted, including mine, during our time at 745 Commonwealth Avenue, but most of us came into seminary with a fairly clear sense of our future vocation. Such is not the case with our current student body. While some come to prepare for a vocation as an ordained deacon or elder or a professor, many come seeking seeking to discern their vocational path, their spiritual path, or some combination of both. We have an increasing number, though it is still small, of some students who have little to no faith background. 
Another significant shift, which was noted on Tuesday, is the average age of our student body is declining. When I was a student, the average age was 36. The average age of our current student body is 28. These shifts in our student body call for parallel shifts in our approaches to teaching and formation as seminary faculty and staff. Previous assumptions about who is in our classroom and where they're headed vocationally no longer hold. At BU School of Theology, we've been trying to address these shifts in a number of ways, the most significant being a curriculum revision two years ago. This vision offers students greater flexibility in meeting their degree requirements and places strong emphasis on contextual education. Prior to this curriculum revision, contextual education was primarily the responsibility of the Office of Field Education. Students engaged in contextual education through internships in congregations and community settings. This was distinct from classroom work, which at least in our setting was often implicitly and sometimes explicitly seen as the real work of the seminary. Now, we are seeking to integrate contextual education into all facets of the seminary experience, particularly the classroom. The following definition of contextual education appears on our website and I think describes well the aspirations that we have for the education of our students. It states, a theological curriculum concentrating on contextual education engages people in rethinking what it means to be human in relation to God, other people and cultures, and the whole of creation. This kind of rethinking requires people to know with their whole beings, engaging all of the senses, challenging preconceptions, and getting our hands dirty, literally and figuratively. Such rethinking leads people to acknowledge that what we do not know is greater than what we do know, but to recognize ceaseless opportunities for new knowledge, often emerging in unlikely places. The BU School of Theology curriculum is one aspect of this fundamental rethinking, focused particularly on classroom education and internships. Simultaneously, the school is reconfiguring our community practices, co-curricular learning, and physical space, knowing that how we are together and where we are together shape our theologies and our lives. This statement highlights several aspects of seminary education that in addition to solid foundations in scripture, theology, and other traditional aspects of the seminary curriculum are necessary for forming leaders for ministry in the 21st century. I'd like to just focus on three of these aspects. First, seminary education requires developing skills for rethinking and this is as much a task for those of us as professors as it is for our students, as we need to rethink methodologies and assumptions that may have been accurate and adequate in the past, but are no longer appropriate. Rethinking, however, is an ongoing task for all of us in ministry in the 21st century, as we need to be increasingly responsive and creative in the face of significant cultural shifts, while staying grounded in the foundations of our faith. Students need to develop deep abilities in learning to read their context, to discern demographic realities, patterns of communication and leadership, and places in need of transformation in the communities in which they find themselves. They need to learn the language of their setting in order to share the love of Christ in ways that people can understand it. In addition to this ability of doing what we call sight exegesis, Strong skills in theological reflection and discernment also need to be a significant emphasis in seminary education if students are going to be equipped to navigate the changing realities of 21st century ministry grounded in their faith tradition. Another important emphasis for seminary education in the 21st century, highlighted in our understanding of contextual education, is that it be holistic, engaging all aspects of who we are as human beings, and engaging all of our senses. BU's commitment to diversity in many aspects, ethnic, racial, denominational, etc., acknowledges that students have much to learn from one another as well as from their professors. This holistic learning also happens through an increasing number of travel seminar courses, both international, such as a trip to Israel and Palestine last winter through our Religion and Conflict Transformation Program, and local, an upcoming travel seminar to rural Maine to explore how churches are addressing issues of rural poverty. 
Our recent curriculum revision also included a commitment to contextual learning experiences in classroom-based courses. For example, just yesterday, our Practices of Faith class took a trip to Lawrence, Massachusetts, a city with one of the highest rates of urban poverty in the state, which also happens to be where the New England Annual Conference offices are located. While there, they engaged in service projects and met with annual conference, local church, and community leaders to learn about ways they are addressing community needs. These experiences engage students in a way that simply studying these issues in a classroom cannot, and provide them with skills necessary for learning about and engaging with community contexts in present and future ministry settings. The statement that we quote, acknowledge that we do not know what we do not know is greater than what we do know, but recognize ceaseless opportunities for new knowledge often emerging in unlikely places, unquote, implicitly highlights a third necessary emphasis for seminary education at BU. And that is providing creative space for students to design their own learning experiences. As part of our curriculum revision, Masters of Theological Studies majors now have a required contextual education component of their degree program. They have a variety of options for completing this requirement, but one is the design and implementation of a contextual education project. One student is working with a local church to design a Christian education program that's based on their vision and mission. We're also trying to be more flexible in how MDiv students fulfill the contextual education requirement for their program. We also have an increasing number of new church starts and restarts starts on our site list, as well as ethnic and multicultural congregations and community sites. Another implementation is a grant called Springboard, which provides funding for students to engage in contextual learning outside of classroom requirements. Projects funded included two students who traveled to Afghanistan to work with a peace activist there, and one student who did a summer internship with the Wesley Foundation at the University of Hawaii. I personally would like to accompany that one. <laughs> we are still very much in transition in implementing these changes and living into the implications of them for our mission as a seminary. Even those of us who fully embrace these initiatives need to engage in ongoing self-examination to be aware of our own blind spots and places where our expectations are grounded in an old paradigm rather than an emerging one. There is, however, widespread acceptance that these changes in our curriculum and community life are necessary for equipping our students to address changes in culture, to be nimble and creative in the face of changing realities, to take responsibility and initiative for their own learning and ongoing formation, and to develop enough resistance to withstand the inevitable resistance to, on, to changing well-established patterns of doing church that are comfortable for many of us, but no longer effective. As BU has found itself being stretched and challenged and encouraged by the visions for Christian mission and service that are being lived out by our students, I pray there is room in our congregations and conferences for such stretching as well. In this process of preparing students for ministry, ordained and otherwise, United Methodist faculty at BU shared a desire for stronger relationships with boards of ordained ministry throughout our connection. A few consistent themes emerge in our conversations about working with students in the candidacy process. Our United States students come from 35 states. A number of my faculty colleagues and I provide um, courtesy mentoring for several of our students. And even if we're not in official mentoring relationships with our students, our advisees still seek guidance for making sure their ordination process is on track. With this level of geographical diversity and the varying requirements of each annual conference, the mentoring process can be sometimes challenging, to say the least. Ideally, our faculty would hope for more streamlining of ordination processes across the denomination. What is more likely realistic would be a common repository for the ordination requirements of each annual conference that could be referred to as we work with students. A list of contact persons for boards of ordained ministry would be helpful so students and faculty know who to call with any questions. This need for greater communication between students, boards of ministry, and the seminary manifests in other ways as well. Some of our students are well supported by their DCOMs and boards of ministry. However, as I've heard voiced by several participants here this week, 
A number of our students have struggled with receiving information from non-responsive district superintendents or DCOMs, which has delayed their processes for months and in one case of our students in over a year. Some students also report feeling isolated from their home conferences with little communication from their DCOMs during their time at school. Improving means of support will alleviate many of the communication issues and interruptions that can disrupt a candidate's process. We also have concern for our doctoral students who are pursuing ordination, particularly in the order of elder. Expectations that candidates for elders spend their provisional period in full-time ministry in a local church have negatively impacted our doctoral students seeking ordination in one of three ways. is either slowed down or diminish the quality of their doctoral work, they give up on the ordination process, or they discontinue their doctoral studies. The long-term result of this could be fewer ordained persons teaching in our seminaries. At BU, we're trying to build a stronger partnership with the leadership and ministries of the New England Annual Conference, a partnership that had been largely neglected until recent years. We believe that stronger communication and resourcing will benefit both the seminary and the church. I would be interested in hearing from those of you with experience in partnering with seminaries in your areas to see how those relationships have developed, both in terms of what has worked and what hasn't. We also welcome visits from annual conference boards of ministry and cabinet members to BU, whether or not you currently have a student enrolled there. We love to give students the opportunity to learn about ministry opportunities across the connection and give you the opportunity to meet the gifted and talent, talented students who grace our halls. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Reverend Yoakum, for the invitation to be part of this panel. Thank you, my panel colleagues, and thank you, the faithful remnant, uh, for, for being here this morning. I always look forward to an opportunity to be in conversation and to continue thinking about what it means to prepare, as we say at Garrett Evangelical, bold spiritual leaders for the church, the academy, and the world. And so uh, this is one of those opportunities. I've been on the faculty at Garrett Evangelical for 27 years now and have been the academic dean for the last seven years and have had opportunity to um, see what's been happening over a period of time. So I do welcome this uh, chance to speak with you. I also took advantage of uh, getting a little more feedback from about half our faculty with the questions around which we were assigned, and so you'll hear their uh, feedback woven into my own comments. I want to start by um, just saying a, a few words about the contemporary context of doing theological education um, for the church and in the world, and there is indeed a changing landscape in terms of doing theological education. Whenever we go to the Association of Theological Schools for meetings, we regularly hear about how things are changing. And so there are challenges to the United Methodist Seminaries in particular, and I think also to mainline and old line denomination seminaries. There are diminishing, as we know, there's diminishing membership in these denominations and in the United Methodist Church, and at the same time, their renewal efforts going on. And so sometimes church leaders are looking to the seminaries to help, and sometimes church leaders are blaming the seminaries, and sometimes the seminaries are blaming the church. And so there's a little bit of um, adversarial dynamic that can be going on. And so I'll just tell you right now what my punchline is on this, and it's obvious and we already know this but we must be working together with some shared common goals. And I think we've got to find ways to do that rather than sometimes getting pitted against each other. There are 13 United Methodist seminaries and some of the larger context uh, leads some persons to say perhaps we don't need 13 United Methodist seminaries. There's a shrinking pool of people seeking ordination. And you can imagine this makes some seminary personnel pretty nervous when this question comes up but it's also created a very competitive dynamic for enrollment, so that's another piece of the context. There's heightened attention to evaluating and assessing leadership for effectiveness. We, we heard the marvelous work of Rick Deshaun, that's D-E-S-H-O-N, <laughs> yesterday. I've been working with Rick on that committee uh, for a number of years. He's a great guy. Um, 
But he's doing fabulous work. And we also know about the Vital Congregations uh, initiative that's going on. Both these things are trying to attend to what is effective leadership in the church. There are a number of things I've grouped under the rubric of globalizing trends. And so we'll start with the 2040 dynamic, which is something that we hear from ATS, that by 2040, um, in the United States, the white majority will no longer be the white majority. And in some of our cities, this is already the case. There are huge implications for theological education in this, in terms of who's teaching, who's there studying, who's um, administrating, what are we teaching, what are the processes by which we are teaching, and the reality that the white dominant way of doing things cannot be the order of business going forward. And so we're highly challenged with that. The world economy, we are all aware of that. Our students come to us uh, with great indebtedness and they incur more indebtedness. And so there's a challenge uh, around funding um, theological education. This has implications for students being part-time students rather than full-time students, students working full-time, trying to be full-time students, trying to be part-time students. So the whole experience of education is affected by this. And the other thing that we're learning uh, in the world economy, and we, al we already know this, but we are each affected by what other people do in the world, and we're all in this in a very big way together, in a very global way together. There are increasing environmental concerns about the sustainability of our planet and how we li live. There's poverty and disease, which continues to increase across the globe. It's massive. We're dealing with hunger, HIV, AIDS, malaria. And though I don't have the exact date, I put 2020 here, but I'm not sure about this. Gerontologists are telling us that in fairly short order, 25% of the world's population will be over 65. So they're saying 65 to 75 is the young old, 75 to 85 is the old, and 85 and above is the very old. So that's shifting. It has implications for people working longer and for healthcare needs and for how we're preparing people to do ministry. And then there's the digital age, and you're gonna see this mentioned several times in my remarks. There's just no, no escaping it. Uh, and we saw that wonderful way in which uh, Meg had us uh, Twittering early on. It's just incredible what's happened, <clears throat> excuse me, with this. So we see it in communication, we see it in business, we see it in the use of social media, we see it in higher education with the press to do online digital learning. Um, and there are justice issues. <clears throat> excuse me, there are justice issues about this in terms of who has access to digital ways of communicating and learning. <clears throat> when I think about challenges to theological education, my mind t tends to go in two directions. That, er that is that there are stable concerns, stable factors in theological education, and I think Wanda alluded to this, that there are things that we need to do no matter what's happening in the world, and then there are newer things, newer concerns. And so I would suggest that spiritual formation and spiritual disciplines is one of those stable factors, even as some of the content might shift a bit, so that we're trying to be sure that we're teaching varying traditions in spiritual formation and disciplines. The need remains for the capacity and the ability to articulate a call and to own and claim and appropriate that call. Uh, it's important that our graduates are theologically grounded and ethically grounded. I think that the ability to think theologically is probably the most distinctive thing that comes from a theological education, and it's a real gift to the public arena um, of our world. The capacity to care for the neighbor remains. And even in our pastoral care and pastoral theology theories have shifted away from focusing on the individual to thinking about systems, uh, theory to thinking about um, cultural differences, gender differences, class differences, power analysis. Even so, we know that there remains a baseline need for capacity to be empathically related to people and to learn skills about how to love our neighbor. And then finally, being biblically literate. As Wanda indicated, we get more and more students who ha perhaps have no religious background. These are the I'm spiritual but not religious types. Uh, or even if they have a bit of religious background, they really don't have much Bible content knowledge. 
So it's very important that they have knowledge of the Bible, that they're theologically facile and, and being able to work with biblical material, and that they can make the Bible relevant to what's happening right now. Now, the new concerns, and I put this in quotation marks because we could argue a little bit about how new some of this is, uh, but we, we won't argue. We'll just say that this is what's, what's happening. There's a need for uh, intercultural uh, literacy. At, at uh, Garrett Evangelical, we've start, started to talk about intercultural rather than multicultural, meaning that we're not interested in parallel play. Let's not just get a bunch of different people in the room and say we're doing something multicultural. We need to be able to interact with each other. And we need to be able to learn how to be comfortable and to celebrate and to collaborate with difference, even as we're trying to find common ground. Again, as I've said, this has implications for who the administrators are, the faculty, the students who show up, the process that we're in. And I appreciated Bishop McKee's uh, comment about some of his vision for the uh, North Texas Annual Conference. In Chicago, we're the fourth largest uh, population of Hispanic, Latino, Latina persons. It's unconscionable that we don't have a full degree offered in Spanish and that we're not doing more with that population. So that, that is a priority. I've mentioned dig digital literacy and the use of social media. Our students are typically way ahead of us on this, but the question arises, how much of this do we need to be teaching in terms of this being a tool that uh, ministers can use in their congregations and, and communicating and blogging and so forth? The call for broader ministries beyond the local church. There's nothing new about that in a way. We've been doing specialized ministry preparation, uh, extension ministries, but these students who come who are, who are not interested in the institutional church, which is a sad thing, they're discouraged by what they see and they're discouraged by the stories they hear. They're not interested in ordination, but they do have the fire in the belly to make a difference in the world, to do something transforming. So we have an opportunity to work with them, but we need to listen and be open to their creative ministries and find a way to prepare them for that and find a way to help the church be supportive in that. I mean, my secret hope, not so secret, is that while we have them for two or three years, we can help them get in into the church. Yes. Um, the development of creativity and the use of imagination. We know that creative leadership is needed, and that uh, adaptive leadership is needed. Uh, again, uh, paying attention to systems theory and power analysis and contextual analysis. Thank you, Wanda. I know that Boston University, my alma mater, has been a leader in this contextual um, focus in a way. But we want our graduates to be able to imagine what the gospel values look like now in these particular kinds of circumstances that we're in. And I would just call your attention to a piece of research that was done by the Carnegie Mellon uh, Institute called Educating Clergy. There's a long discussion in that book about pastoral imagination. And again, one of the unique gifts that religious leaders, United Methodist leaders, can bring. There's a call for explicit leadership training. And so uh, some of our schools, Garrett Evangelicals, one of them, Duke, I know, are offering postgraduate leadership training in conjunction with business schools, management schools, so nonprofit um, leadership certificates, for example. Skills in conflict management, skills in being a change agent, uh, greater knowledge about financial management, those are some of the kinds of things, developing mission and vision. And at the same time, we know that from our leadership research that 65% of leaders, even those who have been very successful leaders, 67% of them will derail at some point. And often the issue is lack of self-awareness. So while we're teaching skills, we also have to be attending to personhood at the same time. And then finally, capacity for dialogue with those who are not religious. Um, as I've said, we get students who are spiritual but not religious. I think of uh, St. Augustine's words in, in the, I believe, the first page of the Confessions where he says, you know, my heart is restless until it rests in you, O God. And if we believe that's part of our human nature, then if our students are spiritual but not religious, 
we've got great potential to work with them and uh, in, their, in their ministries with what they'll be doing. I also look to our evangelism and mission professors to help us a little bit and how we dialogue with people who are not religious per se without always having a proselytizing agenda. I mean, how do we create that space to listen and learn before we um, start sharing our witness? All right, um, and then the last thing I really wanna say is, a, is to make a call for enhanced partnerships with congregations, community leaders, and boards of ordained ministry. We need regular communication with each other and we need to provide ways to give and receive feedback. Panels like this are, are the beginning. We need shared goals. I was thinking about how much energy we spend in the seminaries articulating our curricular goals. We have to for accreditation purposes. And I, I, I felt convicted that when we articulate these goals, we're not, not always in touch with boards of ordained ministry. What are your goals? What are our goals? Let's get these goals together. And I was very taken by Rick Deshawn's uh, suggestion yesterday that perhaps the KSAPs, the knowledge, skills, abilities, and personal characteristics for effective ministry might provide some kind of foundation for developing uh, common shared goals. And then we need to develop some structures to support and protect these processes of communication. So I suggest just some beginning initial ideas, um, and we've been doing some of this, field education, site supervisors, having regular uh, conversation meetings with seminary faculty and boards of ordained ministry and congregation uh, mentors. And, though, and finally, then, the last thing I would say is what I really would love to hear, what do you need from the seminaries? How can we be helpful to you? And I hope that we'll have some time to talk about that. Thank you so much. Is this working? Oh, it is. I just love it. Okay, um, thank you. I, I need to walk around a little bit um, because I've already sat and stood since early, early this morning. Um, I left the United States in 1985 with the General Board of Global Ministries. I was gone effectively for 20 years. Um, when I moved back, what I found in Dallas was that Dallas looked a lot more like the countries in Southeast Asia and Europe that I had been in or the congregation of largely Africans that I had served in Vienna that Dallas looked a lot like that. It looked much more pluralistic, culturally pluralistic, and other things complicated, but that the churches that I visited in Dallas looked the same as they looked in 1970, and that the seminary that I had graduated from hadn't changed too much either. Um, and that seemed to me to be problematic. So I've spent about eight years now thinking about what's going on, and I'm gonna be offering you four, my, my colleagues have done a terrific job of outlining a bunch of stuff that I have to just agree with, and I, we will need to go back to that. But I want to say four things that I think have changed um, that are critical challenges for our seminaries in which we have to address. And the first one, I'll go up through all four, then we'll take them up in depth. The first one is the changing composition and structure of the local church. Local churches just don't look like they looked when I was in seminary, and I think that most of what I learned in seminary would probably be irrelevant to running a modern local church. Um, so continuing education becomes critical for pastoral ministry. The changing society and political marginalization of the mainline churches deeply affects the way we think about our social ministries. We are no longer important. I'll just do this one real fast. We're not important. The United Methodist Church has no political clout at all. You can see this because in our general conferences on the critical social issues, we always vote one way or another by razor-thin majorities. That means we stand on both sides. We're a giant bell curve resembling the entire United States electorate, and therefore no politician needs to pay attention to us because we can't deliver a vote on anything, and they don't pay attention to us. When was the last president of the United States that would deign to see a delegation of United Methodist bishops? I believe it precedes Ronald Reagan. Okay? We've got to take that seriously because that affects the way we imagine our social ministries. The third thing is we now live in a world of intercultural environments and the rapid rise of microcultures that we have to address. And the fourth thing is we have a huge installed user base. <laughs> and big installed user bases make it hard to change things dramatically and rapidly because the installed user base, which largely funds you, by the way, doesn't want to change dramatically and rapidly. 
Um, and by the way, that user base is not diminishing. Um, in some senses, it's growing in terms of number of retired people and that sort of thing. So let me go into depth about these a little bit and explain what I mean. The changing composition and structure of the local church. One of the things that happened while I was out of the United States, and I noticed it because I was in kind of more conservative settings, is that the General Conference granted local churches the ability to substantially change their internal structuring of their life and ministry. When I was graduating from Perkins School of Theology, you went into a local church, and the program structure and the administrative structure was dictated by the General Conference, and you got a bunch of books from the Board of Higher Education and Ministry that told each person, each program chair, et cetera, exactly what their job was and how they related to their equivalent at a district annual conference and national level. That's all gone. And that has profound implications. The second thing that's gone is we would rely, if we were pastors, on facilitating a church in which you had strong lay leaders who were thoroughly grounded in the United Methodist tradition and who therefore could be counted upon to work in this setting according to these fixed structures. They're gone too. We're a post-denominational age. Many of the church's leaders, even the older leaders, don't come out of a United Methodist tradition. They don't know anything about it. They don't know anything about the connectional system. And what does that say then? If you're a pastor in this church, you're now required to do at least one thing you never had to do before, not facilitate, but to actually manage, to develop leadership teams, to form structures within a local church that will lead that local church into effective ministry because that's not just handed to you on a plate anymore or by your predecessor. And secondly, of course, you're being pushed constantly, if you're a pastor, to be entrepreneurial, to start new stuff, new congregations, new worship services, to reach out to young people that you never reached out before in ways that you never did before because the youth group wasn't working. So we're asking our pastors, this is the first challenge of the seminary, to be managers and entrepreneurs rather than facilitators of an existing structure of ministry. And that's a dramatic shift in what we ask of our pastors. Dramatic. Our marginalization politically means that we no longer have the political voice we had, so we have to reconceive our social ministries and recognize the fact that we're not going to have a lot of traction at a national political level or even a local political level, and therefore a political voice may not be the most effective way to change things. I don't, I don't have an answer for that, by the way. I'm just telling you that in the seminary <laughs> where we are, that means that when we teach students about how to engage in important justice and social ministries, we have to take into account our political marginalization. We are effectively a minority in a country run by bigger groups than us. The third thing is the intercultural environment and the rise of microcultures. I spent my formative years in Richardson, Texas. In the years that I lived there in junior high and high school, it was called a city of churches. Now it has three mosques, two Hindu temples, and First United Methodist Church Richardson that I was raised in, the actual physical building I was raised in, is now a major Taiwanese Buddhist center. And that was it. That's a huge building. By the way, kudos off to the architects in the 1960s who decided to build it in a then fashionable japanese style. Um, it, <laughs> the complete lack... <laughs> The complete lack of representational art and the easy removal of the cross meant that it was one of those few church buildings that could be sold to be something other than a bar. So, um, but, but that's a challenge, and I, that's the one I want to address the most because this is where I'm at, really, in, in theological education, is this problem of the changing cultural environment and the rise of microcultures. One of the things that we assumed when I graduated from school was that as pastors, we would gradually work our way up to increasingly large Anglo congregations, unless we were African American, in which we would hope to work up to increasingly large African American congregations. We never anticipated that the two would ever merge or do anything together, even though they were in the same annual conference. And now, what we found is that there's been both a rapid generational cultural change so that we are culturally estranged from our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and that the process of that is happening faster and faster, right? So we don't have a stable cultural environment even within our congregations. We certainly don't have a stable congrega uh, cultural environment within our society as a whole. And even as we face this instability, okay, we find the development, the rapid development of microcultures, of small cultural groupings, 
Uh, I recently spent some time doing consultation with a with a uh, ad agency here in Dallas that does entirely cross-cultural, intercultural marketing. And one of the reasons I was talking to them is because they were, although they have some anthropologists that work for them, right? They said our problem is that we have to look at Dallas as, a, as not as a Latino culture, not as an Anglo culture, not as a this culture, that culture. We have to look at it as a series of microcultures. The concept of African American culture is breaking down. There are many African American cultures. The concept of Latino culture is breaking down. It's no longer Mexican American, right? Because there's Salvadorans and Guatemalans and Hondurans and all these others, and those are different cultures, okay? And so, in fact, when we look out, we've got this complexity, microcultures, rapid cultural change together. And one of the things that means is that we can't go read a book about the millennials or the X or the Y generation, get some information from the book, and then target our ministry at those people that are listed in the book. Our situation is too dynamic. It's too fragmented for that to work, and we can see this in the last 30 years of evangelism based on these characterizations, which we will then try to address, which have, let us be honest, failed. That's why we're a declining denomination. The methodology won't work. And so one of the things we need is not to know about all these different cultures. We need to train pastors who have cultural intelligence, who have the capacity to constantly see, interact, judge, engage in dialogue, see what's working about the way I articulate my message, see what's not working about the way I articulate my message, and change it on the fly. We can't teach them a series of facts in our seminary that will last them more than 25 minutes once they get out. They have to learn how to think on their feet about intercultural and cross-cultural engagements. And that is our biggest challenge, in my view, is to functionally create cultural intelligence. Right? Another way to put that, and I don't want to blow my own horn, we need to create pastors who are missionaries. That's what missionaries do. That's the task of mission, is to move into new cultural environments, quickly assess how that environment is different, quickly enter into dialogue and partnership with peoples in that, people in that environment, and then begin to, in dialogue and in conversation, articulate what it would mean to speak the gospel in that environment. That is the critical skill, I think, for new pastors. And, of course, we have to do that without it forgetting the installed user base. <laughs> So that they also understand that the aging boomers, like myself, have their own changing and challenging spiritual needs. And that these continue to need to be addressed. And those folks can't be tossed under the bus in order to reach out to the millennials that are the supposed future of the church. So that, by the way, also requires cultural intelligence. Um, I find myself now constantly speaking to Sunday school classes of people of my mother's age a little bit younger, and I realize I'm out of touch with them. My world experience, my everything makes me makes it difficult to communicate with these people my parents' age. I don't understand where they're at. I don't know the challenges they're going through. So when I think cross-culturally, I have to think not only about the, the African Ghanaians, members of my congregation that I used to have in Vienna. I've got to think about people who are 10 years, 15 years older than me. For one thing, they passed through 20 years of U.S. history that I wasn't here for, Right? Um, I can't tell you the difference between being in and out of the United States in 9-11. I was in Austria. Actually, I was actually in Germany at the time. It's a huge difference. So that is our challenge. We need pastors who can be managers and entrepreneurs, and we haven't typically trained for that. We need pastors who are capable of on-the-ground social analysis and especially the intense kind of political analysis of where the church is actually situated politically in our social structures and in our local politics. And we need pastors who are missionaries that possess cultural intelligence. Those are our challenges. I am actually not sure how we're going to meet them. Uh, my colleagues have anticipated a number of things, but one thing is absolutely sure. It's going to have to be in a continual dialogue with our boards of ordained ministries, with all of those people who are in touch with the vast diversity of United Methodist Ministries. And it is going to take change on our part in the seminary. We're going to have to reconceptualize our fundamental tasks, I think. And I want to say that I think we're doing that. At least we're engaging in the conversation. 
um, we got to go further. Thanks. Okay, I'd like now to give the panelists a chance to respond to one another, and then uh, after that, we'll open to the floor for discussion. We have quietly already responded to one another, and we are in 100% consensus that we'd like to open this up to Q&A right now, because we're in agreement. Okay, you've heard it first, right here. Uh, they're in agreement and uh, their presentations were very stimulating. So now uh, we would invite you to come to the mics and ask the questions. With the emphasis on the need for contextual ministry and education, there's this simultaneous move toward um, the virtual education and increased online learning. How do you blend those two? Um, is my context of learning my office and screen? Um, or how do you, especially if two thirds of my um, degree can be earned that way, how do you blend those two? Uh, okay, let me, I'll start with this and then maybe we'll hand it off to Wanda for the contextual piece. Um, this has been a very challenging development. Uh, for education, and I think many of our schools have felt very conservative about doing online education. Uh, is it possible to have a sense of community? What do you do with the contextual questions? Um, how do you train faculty ad adequately for new pedagogies? And, and what's interesting, we've been able to train most all of our faculty through a program online, U Madison, uh, Wisconsin, fabulous program. What's interesting is that the kinds of questions we've had about pedagogy have, have been, uh, the questions in the conversation have been terrific. The other thing that, that we're learning is that there is such a thing as virtual community. We want to think that there's not, but when you, when you realize that you can make space for people's voices that would not normally, who would not normally be heard in the classroom because of cultural differences or introversion or whatever, the online learning levels the decks, so the extroverts don't win the day. I mean, everybody everybody gets to participate in a, in a more um, equal way. At Garrett Evangelical, we're only allowing half, uh, I'm sorry, a third of a degree, because we're still feeling very conservative about this. On the other hand, online education makes it possible for people who don't have access to travel, et cetera, to be able to do things. I know that there's some very clever ways of creating um, local contexts where students are living so that they might participate in something locally and report that in the distance learning format. The other thing that, that uh, we're just beginning to explore is partnerships with other seminaries so that we get a kind of diversity in the online community of learners and we get diversity across campuses rather than thinking we have to have it on the campus or in a specific uh, place. So let me turn to my colleagues and... If Garrett is conservative with a third of their uh, <laughs> credits being able to be distance learning, uh, BU is even more so. There's a fair amount of angst amongst our faculty about um, distance learning and the impact that that does have on formation and formation of community amongst the students. Um, we've got a proposal before our faculty that shows you how far, quote unquote, behind we are, um, to allow 10% of our credits to be via distance learning. Um, we are in the process as the number of opportunities for students in our area to go to university senate approved schools decreases, um, looking at the possibilities of doing geographically based cohorts um, as an answer to some of those distance questions, but um, we're still working through um, that balance between how do you attend to formation, um, what are the implications um, as we're considering distance education. As I pass to Bob, could I just say one more thing? And, and that is to say, here we, here we meet the challenge of market because our, our faculty, too, is very conservative. It's, it's taken years to turn the ship in this direction, and the feeling is this is the way of the world, and if we don't get on board with it, we shall be left behind in the dust. And just, just to say that some of our major United Methodist seminaries who said two years ago, never ever over our dead bodies, are now delivering distance education. <laughs> so. 
Yeah, I just want to add, add a couple of things. One, I like the term distance education um, the, because that articulates the actual problem. The actual problem is how do you get a seminary education when you are at a distance from the physical seminary? And once you articulate the problem that way and forget the computer, forget the online thing, and just talk about distance education, then you can begin to ask the intelligent question, which is, how do we manage a fully useful seminary experience that creates pastors that we want? How do we form those pastors when it is impossible for them to come be resident in our seminaries? And it's simply impossible for an increasing number of students to be resident. Um, now, the online piece of this can be an important piece, and it does involve new pedagogies, and that is scary to faculty. Um, those pedagogies are time intensive, by the way. I've done this before. It takes much more time to set up and manage an online course than it does to do one that's, that's a, a mere lecture course. Um, but it also means that we can do things like we set up small groups in other cities, other towns, so that people have face-to-face -face contact. And I think that's the one piece I would add to this. Ultimately, the ministries for which we are training our students are ministries to people face-to-face. Very, very few of our, of our graduates are going to set up virtual communities. So training in virtual community, as useful as it is, and the fact that some com these communities do exist, and they have the virtues that we've mentioned. They, they allow people to, to interact who would get shut out other times. People who are English as a second language people, right? They don't type so fast. They don't have such a good internet connection. They can be involved in this way. That said, in the end, most of our graduates are going to go into face-to-face -face ministry, and if they don't know how to interact face-to-face -face with people, that's a problem. All I want to say is our theological faculties are conservative. The market is going to force us to change, and we just need to ask the right questions, which is how do we bring education, theological education to folks who can't be resident? If we ask that question, we can do it very effectively. Yeah. Okay, next question. I can only speak of the Hispanic Latino uh, experience. Uh, increasingly, we have seen uh, throughout the country the, the rise of lay leaders uh, in the Hispanic Latino congregations uh, who are church planters, who are uh, going into mission fields beyond the congregations. Uh, many of them uh, do not have formal education a few of them may not have uh, legal documents, but they all need good theological formation. Uh, and we have excellent theological uh, seminars edu uh, education. So the question is, is there a guiding vision in the future that will help our uh, seminaries open up to provide that kind of a theological formation for these non-traditional students. Uh, and if there is, uh, would this be online residence? It would have to be in their language, perhaps. Uh, has, it, has there been any conversation about this uh, as the change is happening already in many of our conferences? Uh, a subsequent question would be for the board, for, for the general board. Uh, once they are trained theologically, is there going to be any status given to them within the structure of the United Methodist Church? Again, this is not formal education, not probably documented. And where are we going to go uh, in regards to this vision? This is one area where we are working on developing more partnership with our annual conference. Um, our annual conference already had been offering a Hispanic Ministry Institute to provide the kind of training that you're um, outlining in um, the Spanish language. Uh, my colleague, Christian Dela Rosa, um, she, she and I joined this faculty together, has taken lead responsibility for um, doing the teaching for that institute. Um, has been bringing, bringing the students to the seminary and um, giving them an opportunity to um, 
really engage with the theological school. So that's definitely an area in which we are hoping to continue to build that. That's a continuing emphasis for us. And um, I think um, it will become stronger. It, as you mentioned, it's really a great, very uh, important area of need in a way that we can really be a great resource um, for our Hispanic congregations in our conference. Um, at Garrett Evangelical, and I think at Perkins as well, we have a Spanish-speaking course of study. And um, we also have advanced course of study in Spanish, which allows our students to get essentially a year's worth of MDiv work in Spanish. But the, but the point you make about the backgrounds of non-traditional students is very, very important. And we've, in Chicago, we have the consortium of about 12 different seminaries, and we've been meeting to try to figure out how to uh, be more responsive to the populations, and partly it's going to mean, I think, finding ways to train people where they are, but also finding ways to get back into the pipeline at the high school, college level, partnering back with other institutions to get some basic education and then to try to bring people into a more formal kind of theological education. Um, well, I, I want to really affirm this, this previous statement that um, at one level, from if you're offering a master's degree, um, the one, one question is, would you offer the master's degree in Spanish, right? And that's, that's a possibility. It's not an easy possibility because, frankly, the number of, of trained theological educators acceptable in a university, right, they have to have a PhD, right, that are fluent Spanish speakers, isn't great. We don't have, Perkins probably has as many as any school in the United States, and we don't have enough to run a full program. Second question is, are you going to have that many students who are fluent Spanish speakers that have a bachelor's degree, right? You're not. So the course, so in fact, it, it becomes economically problematic. You know, you're offering a program for two or three or four students. And that means we have to look back at one level and ask the previous degrees. The course of study school, advanced course of study school in Spanish, is a, is a foundational form of training that's available. I would want to ask, uh, uh, maybe a not politically correct, excuse me, but more foundational question, and it has to do with um, appropriate training in the community and appropriate recognition of gifts and graces. Um, most Methodist pastors in most of the world don't have master's degrees. That's right. This is a United States rarity that we think that you can't be a pastor unless you've got a Bachelor of Arts or something plus a master's degree. Now there's good reasons for that in the, in the structure, the social structure of the church back after about 18, when was the first Methodist Seminary built? 1890, something like that? Earlier. Earlier? 50s. The 50, 1850s? Was it Garrett? I think uh, Boston Hughes. Boston Hughes, the oldest. 1839. 1839. 1853 and... Oh, 1910. Yeah, we're newcomers. Okay. Um, anyway, there was a reason. There was a good reason that we drastically moved beyond a bachelor of divinity, which used to be the basic degree, to a master of divinity. It had to do with the professionalization of the church, rising incomes, the nature of the church that was asking for pastors wanted better educated pastors. Um, we wanted to become a little more Presbyterian in that regard, um, but that we moved in that direction, and that would that made perfect sense in U.S. history. Now we're in a different place in U.S. history, and we're in a different society, and one of the questions then becomes, what is the appropriate level of training for a person who's an ordained minister? Now, that's not, an, that's not a question seminaries can answer, but I think it falls to the seminaries as the main providers of theological education to say, how are we going to be flexible and ready to offer the appropriate theological education to the people who are called to ministry with the gifts and graces? It's going to belong to boards of ordained ministries in the general conference to ask the question, what is the appropriate kind and level of education for people who are serving an ordained ministry in the United Methodist Church? But as you all know, the, the very structure and nature of ordained ministry in the United Methodist Church is in flux and in conversation. So that's, but, but I would say we would do well to look at the world. Okay, I was engaged in course of study school for Bulgarian pastors for seven years when I lived in Austria. Very different models for how they work, the Bulgarians and Macedonians that I taught. Very different models in Indonesia and in Malaysia. Different models are being developed 
in Vietnam, right? Um, the John Wesley School, uh, although Vietnam is burdened because it's a United Methodist Church, right? And therefore, they have to follow our discipline. Okay, so I think that's a big question, but I think that all the seminaries need to react, and Spanish is probably the first place to go for all of us. And I, I would just add from the uh, board's perspective that um, uh, we are working with uh, the seminaries on the Hispanic. Part of the issue is that courses study are for those under appointment, and your question was around training lay leadership, and that's... Um, uh, it, it comes under a little different category in terms of the, of the church uh, structure. I do believe that the question before us is what is effective and sustainable theological education and past ministerial formation for this century? I think we don't know how to answer that question yet. So this will encourage us to, to find creative answers that uh, they've been. We could take one more question. Yes. My name is Tim. I feel burdened by getting the last question. I hope it's a good one. Um, Raina, when you studied this whole thing at the very beginning, I think your comment was, um, and I know I'm guilty of it too, wow, I wish our seminaries did a better job of preparing students. And I thought that might have set and I'm, you know, a defensive posture in terms of seminaries and what we are or aren't doing. I, I'd be really curious if, if the three of you would take an, uh, an offensive posture. And what would you say to the board's of ordained ministry for the United Methodist Church and say, um, listen up. This is what is from our perspective, what we know, what we see, what we hear. Um, what would you like to translate to us to take home instead of us just um, having an opportunity to listen to what you brought for us? I'll, I'll take a first cut if that's okay. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that four years of theological education can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. <laughs> um, if, if you're expecting a highly competent manager entrepreneur out of a relatively introverted person who deeply likes to reflect on theology and Bible and who was raised up through your youth groups, okay, that isn't going to happen. And I think boards of ordained ministries need to take on board that the kind of people who might have made really effective ministers 45 years ago, okay, because it was a different model of church, are not going to be effective ministers now no matter how much education they get. So either the church has got to find a place for those kind of special ministries, which it can do, okay, or it's going to have to start saying earlier to people, you know what, you're just not a candidate for what the church of the 21st century needs. I don't think it's the place of the seminary to take these students in who've made a huge commitment and then who after two years or three years of, of burning $30,000 a year in student loans, and then we're supposed to tell them, I'm sorry, you're not going to make it as an ordained minister. We're not going to do that. I'm being very honest. We're not going to do that. We're going to graduate them, okay? And then they're going to be back in your hands. That's just the fact of the matter. It's the flat reality. Um, so that would be my first thing. The second thing I would say is, so start going out and looking for the young people who have the gifts and graces for tomorrow, most boards of ordained ministry are made up of people my age or slightly younger. So don't look for yourselves. Okay? Look for someone quite different than yourself. Okay, I'm sorry, that's very blunt, but I, just a quick apology. The dean has no idea what I was going to say here, and he will not approve of any of it. <laughs> but you were invited to be on the offensive, so here we okay, are. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Tim, for the question, uh, and I quite concur with, uh, with what Bob has said. Um, I will tell you, my field is pastoral care, and there are so many mental health issues in our seminary population. It's unbelievable what we deal with, and I, I want to echo, uh, you probably would be horrified if you knew more about it, uh, I, I want to echo the the... the Encouragement to speak truth and love to your candidates, to take these psychological assessments seriously, to have these honest conversations right from the get-go, and to have the courage to say no uh, to some people. The other thing I would say is I think there's a bit of a breakdown in the process where 
our job is to educate we see these fitness issues we can sort of write to them a little bit in the field education reports but we're not really free to pick up the phone because of uh, FERPA and all kinds of other stuff to communicate with, wow, huge red flags here. We, and we're just kind of hoping you, ca you catch them. So there's some kind of a, a communication piece there that I think could be strengthened between the seminaries and the boards of ordained ministry, the DCOMs. I would echo all of what has been said. Um, I think the other piece I would encourage um, boards and cabinets to be aware of is for candidates who are well qualified, well suited, who have strong gifts, to listen to their visions for ministry and try to find places for them to put them in place. Um, so much of the time, I've been on the board in DCOM, so I'm as guilty of this as anyone else in this room. We try to see how they're going to fit with where we are as a conference, even if we do have a vision for what the future might hold. But a lot of times, our candidates have great visions for what they want to be doing and where they want to be doing it. So we need to create space for them as much as possible to really live into these ministries. This is a way that we as the institutional church can support these visionary leaders um, to provide a place for them so that some of that they see that there is a place for them um, in the larger connection of the United Methodist Church. And I think it's important for us to be willing to be educated as much as um, seeking to be evaluative. Thank you all for your attention, even at this uh, late hour. Uh, we're going to be moving uh, into worship. I'll call on Meg Lassier for any announcements. But I'd like for you to give a... a, a a strong round of applause to these faculty because not a lot here.